Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Stuart Reid. I'm another one of the uh, consultants here in Belfast, in PICU, and in anesthesia. Um, so I'm going to carry on from what Valerie's been talking about and move on into um, vasoactive support for pediatric patients uh, in the early stages of resuscitation uh, as they're getting into the critical care system. So a few little pictures. Anybody know what these are on the screen? The anaesthetists probably should do. One's adrenaline, one's noradrenaline. Um, you can try and work out which one you are. There's a prize at the end. Um, but anyway, so. Oh, hang on, what am I doing? Okay, quick disclaimer. This is not a pharmacology lecture, mostly. Okay, just a bit, honest. But what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about vasoactive drugs. I do have to cover what they are, or I'll be struck down by the pharmacology gods. I have to talk about what we're gonna use them for, but actually what I really want to talk about is how to give them outside of the PICU setting. So when to use them when you're resuscitating a child in your emergency department. And we might even actually have a little bit of evidence, which is always an unusual concept in any critical care study. So at this point, all of the anaesthetists in the room can go to sleep or you're gonna have flashbacks of primary FRCA. Everybody else who hasn't got a critical care background, bear with me just for a few minutes. So vasoactive drugs, you have inotropes, positive inotropes increase contractility and therefore increase cardiac output. Positive chronotropes increase the heart rate and therefore also increase cardiac output related to that little formula you learned in your first day in physiology lectures back in medical school. Vasopressors increase your systemic vascular resistance, i.e. your afterload. And they may also increase your preload a little bit by squeezing blood back to the right side of the heart. So they increase the blood pressure. They're two different things, okay? So increasing your cardiac output does not always mean you have an increase in blood pressure. We are not good at measuring cardiac output. There are lots of gadgets and toys. Some are better than others. And we use, uh, historically, blood pressure is used as a surrogate measure for cardiac output. But if you over vasoconstrict somebody with a vasopressor, you may actually decrease their cardiac output. So you have to be aware of what you're using. Have to talk about receptors, and we're gonna keep it very simple. And the main ones to be important to think about are the adrenergic receptors, and it boils down to alpha or beta. If a drug primarily works on the alpha side of things, it will vasoconstrict and increase your SVR, so it's a vasopressor. If they're primarily beta effect, they increase the beta one, will increase your myocardial contractility and tachycardia, and essentially those are inotropes. So the balance of alpha and beta will be how your drug works if it works on the adrenergic receptors. All these other ones are a little um, less important. You're getting more into ICU territory here, except for the dopaminergic receptors, which actually, when it boils down to it, are irrelevant to blood pressure control. And that's because I don't like dopamine as a drug. I'll come to that in a wee while. This is how they work. They all work by messing around with G proteins and receptors in your cardiac muscle, and they essentially increase the amount of cyclic AMP, which increases your contractility, either by boosting its production or inhibiting its breakdown. Okay, and there are different classes of drugs that do that. So again, no talk about inotropes is complete without a table with lots of alphas and betas and pluses and minuses on it, and this is essentially it. And I'm only gonna concentrate on, like, oh, I've left out, sorry. That's the wrong addition. Um, we'll cover the adverse effects in a little minute. But there's only a couple I really want to concentrate on. This is uh, some of the um, array of drugs that we can use in uh, pediatric intensive care. But when you're dealing with patients in uh, the early stages in your DGH, the important ones are dopamine, adrenaline, and possibly noradrenaline, okay? So we just have a quick look at dopamine there. There's this mythical idea of its, of its multi-level dosing, um, and low dose was supposed to be protective to your kidneys. That is not true. And the middle dose is mostly inotropic, and the higher doses are mostly vasopressive. Um, the difficulty with that is that the clearance of these drugs and the volume of distribution between small infants and adults is so variable that you know, it's really hard to know exactly how much you're actually achieving as a target concentration. So, best to know that generally the higher the dose, it'll act more like a presser. The lower the dose, it'll be more like an inotrope, but it often will give you a very severe tachycardia, which isn't always beneficial. Adrenaline, 
is the one we tend to reach for primarily, and we'll come to that in a minute. But it's essentially, it is a vasopressor in higher doses. So above 0.1, not should say mics per kilo per minute, um, you are getting a vasopressor effect. Below that, it is more of an inotrope. Um, and again, thinking about how much you're administering, you need, to, uh, you need to be aware of the dose that you're applying and actually the physiological effect. Noradrenaline is primarily a vasopressor, but it has a little, little bit of inotropic effect, but it's much more um, potent at the alpha receptors. Okay, so that's the pharmacology gods appeased. Now we need to talk about some of the important stuff. So we're going to talk about pediatric shock, and I'm carrying on from where Valerie basically left off. So you get a shocked baby coming into your district general hospital emergency department. The most common etiologies are, first of all, sepsis. Next, most likely, will be a hypovolemic shock. And that'll be a trauma, which will be pretty apparent, usually, or just from other severe fluid losses, e.g. Um, GI losses. After that, you're into anaphylactic and other sort of distributive shocks, like liver failure, things like that. And then, further, actually further down the line, it is more common than people think, but cardiogenic shock is uncommon in children in the, this classical form. And that can be because of, say, a cardiomyopathy um, in, a, in an otherwise structurally normal heart or an infection like myocarditis. Or you could have a congenital patient with a congenital cardiac disease, and that can be obstructive or ischemic, depending on what way the plumbing is connected. These are very specialized groups, and I'm not going to dwell on them today. And you really should be getting specialist advice, either from us or from the cardiology team, uh, to discuss what kind of or what kind of vasoactive support you might need for that patient. But we're really going to concentrate more on particularly septic shock. Okay, so pediatric septic shock. Classical teaching will say that septic shock is distributive. So the patients are warm, vasodilated, they're um, very tachycardic, they have a hyperdynamic bounding circulation and they can be hypotensive. So, hands up who's seen an infant come into their ED department with septic shock looking like that? Yeah, exactly, okay. So, pediatric septic patients, particularly infants and younger patients, are cold, mottled, tachycardic, tachypneic with increased work of breathing, often grunting. They will have a reduced, they can have a reduced level of consciousness and they can be hypotensive, which is a deeply concerning and late sign in sepsis uh, or in the shock, okay? So not what we would classically think of in adult practice as septic shock, where they may be reaching for vasopressors. So pediatric septic shock is more often a cold shock. And that is because there is a significant element of myocardial dysfunction involved, okay? It's not just about distributive vasodilation um, from the toxemia. They also are more prone to develop hypovolemia. So they can be a bit underfilled. Um, so there's a relative hypovolemia there. So they have a low cardiac output, not a high vasodilated cardiac output. They will be peripherally constricted, not vasodilated, hence the mottling, which preserves the blood pressure. And hypotension, as I said, is a late and dangerous sign. So in my opinion, and I'll back this up with a little bit of evidence, the drug of choice, and it's not just my opinion, it's in all the guidelines as well, so the drug of choice is adrenaline, okay? It is worth remembering that, and we see this usually later on in the intensive care, that it is a dynamic process and they may then go on to develop more like a warm shock picture when you have adequately resuscitated with volume and applying the appropriate inotropes, okay? so. Valerie's covered a lot of this already, um, and Mark, thank you. Um, but uh, we know that you have to identify shock patients early and they respond quickly. And it's difficult in children, and small, or small children and infants, um, because they're non-specific signs. But I can't emphasize how, emphasize how bad hypotension is. So you're gonna give your fluid boluses of an isotonic crystalloid and you're gonna reassess after each one. In the guidelines which have been produced by, all the way back to 2002, generally the trigger, pulling the trigger on vasoactive support, is around 60 mils per kilo. And that is quite rightly being looked at because, as Mark said, this is a really, really good paper. So there are so many papers now on fluid 
administration to pediatric patients and fluid balance in PICU that they're able to actually do a full meta-analysis on it. And there is no circumstance where fluid overload is associated with a better outcome in all groups of critically ill patients, whether they're on renal replacement therapy, whether they're in PICU, cardiac ICU, or even still on a ward. Fluid overload is not a good thing. So you want balanced, adequate resuscitation. And if you're up and around getting up to 60 mils per kilo, you really should be thinking, I need something more here, rather than just applying more and more fluid into the patient. OK? So, and there is evidence behind this. There's a lot of evidence behind it, actually. When to start vasoactive drugs. So if your patient is fluid refractory, you've given your 60 mils per kilo fluid bolus, and it may be that they have a normal blood pressure, but they're still mottled, they're still tachycardic, um, they may be grunting in their breathing. You know, there's signs of shock there which are not, really, not necessarily meaning hypotension, but you have not resolved the patient's shock. Even more importantly, don't keep plowing the fluid into the patient if they are already showing signs of overload. So check for an enlarged liver, check for um, basal crackles, uh, check for worsening hypoxia. Is this patient, um, the patient is actually not responsive to fluid now and definitely needs vasoactive support. So then everybody says, all oh, right, so the patient needs intubated, intubated now to put a central line in. So that takes time. You're gonna move your patient possibly up to your theater block or you're gonna do this and the other. And all that time, the patient is going to be under resuscitated. And that is not a good idea. The hourly delay, so back in 2003, Hans group looked at um, hourly delays in the restoration of normal blood pressure. And again, they used blood pressure or an improved cap refill so simple measures, any delay, every hour delay in that was associated with a doubling of the adjusted mortality odds ratio. So if you leave it for more than an hour, you're increasing the mortality rate in a septic patient. And then that was an American, I think that was an American study. Um, NIN's group were working in the UK, I think, and uh, they looked at delays in inotrope resuscitation in meningococcal sepsis back before uh, the vaccination sort of reduced the incident. And if you delayed inotropic delivery to patients who had fluid refractory meningococcal sepsis, and he didn't say how much extra fluid was given, but it put a massive increase in the adjusted mortality. Okay. So you need to get these things going quickly. Okay. Valerie mentioned the American College of Critical Care Medicine clinical guidelines. This is the summary. Okay. And there's some very important things in here. Uh, this takes you right the way down into sort of um, full intensive care support for cardiac shock. So, but the first sort of half is the most relevant part for um, your practice if you're resuscitating these patients in your emergency department when they come in in the middle of the night. Okay, I hope that projects okay. It's a wee bit small, but there's a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. First of all, is look at these times. So they are essentially saying. You should be assessing and giving your fluid boluses, first fluid bolus within five minutes, okay? This is quick, responsive um, uh, treatment, okay? And that's your 20 mils per kilo of isotonic fluid, okay? And you continue to administer that. By the time they're looking and considering whether you actually have fluid refractory shock, you should be within 15 minutes. So if you've given a bolus and the patient gets a lot better, great. Okay, happy days. But if they don't, you should continue and then think about continuing again. But by the time you're uh, through your second bolus, you should be thinking, I may need more support here. So within 15 minutes, they are talking about fluid refractory shock. And what it says is, I hope you can all read it because I can't from here, begin peripheral IV or interosseous inotrope infusion, preferably ep epinephrine or adrenaline, at the given dose, and it's uh, between 0.05 and 0.3 mics per kilo per minute, okay? So they are saying within 15 minutes of your septic baby arriving in the hospital, you should be thinking about administering. Now, real world, it's gonna be slightly longer than that, but it gives you an idea of how quick you should be responding to these sorts of things. All right, now, so are you gonna get the baby tubed and a central line in, in that time scale? No, obviously you're not. Intubation shouldn't necessarily be just to facilitate IV access. Intubation in itself 
can be beneficial to the patient who has reduced cardiac output if you do it carefully, but that's not what we're getting at here. And actually this can make your life much more easy when you get to uh, going to intubate this patient, which they will probably need. So um, at 60 minutes, you're into catecholamine resistance shock, and that's really where we're more involved. And hopefully at this stage, you're either getting significant advice from your ICU referral team, or they're there and working with the patient as well. Okay. So how do you give inotropes early? So who here has given dopamine as a peripheral infusion? Quite a lot. No, it's not as many as I thought, actually. Who has given adrenaline as a peripheral infusion? That's really good. I'm actually very pleased about that. I expected it to be the other way around. So peripheral inotropes are very effective, and they are safe if you look after the line and do it carefully. Classically, as I said, dopamine is the, the common one that was used, um, and it was in the initial guidelines because there's this kind of opinion that dopamine is a relatively safe, innocuous kind of drug. Well, none of the inotropes are safe or innocuous, um, uh, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But the way you can make it up, and we are, our drug calculator covers this, but essentially if you put five milligrams per kilo uh, of, of the patient's weight into 50 mils of normal saline, you can start that at running at five mils an hour, and that will be the equivalent of five micrograms per kilo per minute. Just a quick correction on making up peripheral dopamine. It's actually three milligrams per kilogram you want to put into 50 mils of saline, not five milligrams per kilogram. You can push that up then, double it to get 10, 15, 20. 20 is your top end. If you're on 20 mics per kilo of dopamine, you really need to be on something else if you're not getting an effect. And uh, to be honest, um, I would probably not reach for it in the first place. So adrenaline has, is a recent, a peripheral adrenaline is a recent change in practice. There was a lot of anxiety over unfamiliarity with the drug. That's an intensive care drug, shouldn't be using that. And obviously you'd be worried if it extra visits at a high concentration. So again, there are different ways you can do it, but on our drug calculator, you can put a milligram, one milligram of adrenaline, dilute it into 50 mils of normal saline or 5% dextrose. And your calculation then gives you your 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. So 0.3 times the patient's weight, and you convert that into mils per hour. I would just point out that if you're making this up and the child is under three and a half kilos, you're very close to what the central concentration would be as well. So you might want to think about diluting that again and just you'll have to run it at a slightly higher rate. But that will give you your equivalent inotropic dose. And you want to put, I love putting this into pediatric talks, as large a caliber peripheral IV as you can. But in reality, in a sick, shut down infant, that's going to be difficult. So if it's only a yellow or if you're lucky to get a blue in the saphenous or something like that, run with that. That will be absolutely fine. But you just need to keep an eye on it. Okay. Any other options? Interosseous needles are a godsend. An interosseous needle, any drug that can be given through a central line and its central concentration can be given through an interosseous cannula. So you have a readily available surrogate central line if you can put it, if you can put those in so there's a really really useful um, uh, skill to have so you can give adrenaline at either the central or peripheral concentration you can give noradrenaline you can give dopamine as you must if you must okay and the classical site is proximal tibia but wherever uh, any of the access sites you can get possibly not in the sternum in a small child though okay so you may have noticed by now that i'm giving dopamine a slightly hard time Okay, um, and it seems like quite a lot of people are still using it. I, this, is a, this is a study that just came out a couple of years ago. Um, that's, I really like this study. So Ventura's group looked at pediatric septic patients of all age, range, age ranges with fluid refractory septic shock. And they were, it was a double blind study, so they didn't know which medication they were giving. It was the, it was the, the blinding was effective, so uh, the rates were the same, so you basically started it. You could titrate it up and down, but you didn't know what you were giving. And it was either given peripherally or interosseously. Um, and they had, ended up with about 120 patients, 63 into the dopamine group, 57 into the adrenaline group. They had similar baseline characteristics of severity of illness. And the dopamine was rationalized to 5 to 10 mics per kilo per minute and adrenaline 0.1 to 0.3. They stopped the study early because... <laughs> 
the 28 day mortality in the dopamine group was significantly higher than in the peripheral adrenaline group. So 20.6% versus 7%, a very statistically significant value. Or putting it another way, the odds ratio of dying if you were given dopamine <coughs> instead of adrenaline was 6.5 times more higher. Okay. Um, and they also looked at secondary outcomes, and there was a staggeringly high increase in the incidence of hospital-acquired infections in the dopamine group. Okay. So there is one thing about this, and see who's been paying attention. Is there anything that jumps out at you as to what there might be a slight weakness in this study and otherwise a really very well-run, organized uh, study? Yeah. The dopamine dose is quite low. Dopamine dose max is at 10 mics per kilo, so you're into that sort of just about inotropic, maybe slight vasopressor effect. And the dose of adrenaline is actually relatively high. So that is the one slight deficiency in this study. It may be that they just were under-treating the dopamine group. But, um, you know, 10 mics per kilo is still a reasonable dose, but you can go higher than that. So that's the only issue with that. But even with that, looking at the secondary outcomes, you know, that's a staggeringly high increase in infection rates. So... And how that, and there is, and dopamine is known to have an effect on uh, the immune system as well. So, generally, my feeling would be dopamine should be relegated, and we should use adrenaline. Okay. Infusions are great. Infusions will give you stability. So, if you you now have your patient, you've given them your fluid bolus, um, you've got your adre peripheral adrenaline running. You've probably you're hopefully treating their shock. At this stage, they're this, and they're still needing maybe aliquots of fluid, this is the time to intubate and get them stabilized and get them ready to transfer to intensive care. So use the infusion to stabilize your patient before you put them through another invasive procedure. Okay. But on top of that, if you have your infusion running, that will help. And we would generally recommend that now. If you're preparing to tube the patient, you should be sitting with this ready. But we all need to get ourselves out of trouble every so often as well. So it's worth thinking about using adrenaline to rescue you, okay? And again, it tends to be the drug of choice because most of our patients will be uh, showing signs of a cardiogenic type shock, even if it's not, or the picture is that, even if it's not classically cardiogenic. So what you want to think about is having a push dose or a rescue dose of adrenaline, okay? Carefully administering, um, administering small boluses of IV adrenaline to maintain stability is very appropriate if you have the appropriate monitoring and the patient is that unstable, for example, intubation. So um, bear in mind, try to use the most cardiac stable induction agents you can. So we tend to recommend things like ketamine, um, but have your resuscitation and have your resuscitation doses of adrenaline available. Some patients who are really quite unwell, when you intubate them, they may have a cardiac arrest. So you should have that uh, dose available and also have fluid boluses available. But what if the patient just needs a little bit of a, a, a wee bit more of a push and it's not, they're not in arrest, but they've maybe dropped, dropped their pressure or dropped their blood pressure, or dropped their heart rate a little bit. We have two, there are two ways that you can make up a rescue dose of adrenaline for pediatrics. So the one on the left is a one fits all um, recipe. You make your adrenaline up to 10 mics per mil. So that's the mini jet adrenaline and you dilute it by 10 times, so one mil, make it up to 10. And then if you give 0.1 of a mil of that, you're giving one mic per kilo as a bolus. So that should be 0.1 mils per kilo, rather than 0.1 mils, and that'll be one mic per kilo. Which may be necessary. You might need slightly less than that, 0.5 possibly, and that will give you a temporary boost while you're doing other stabilizing measures. And you can repeat that maybe until your infusion is ready, giving it in small aliquots, okay? Only a difficulty with that is with smaller patients, you can get right down into very tiny little volumes. So you might want to think about diluting it again. Another way that I sometimes use, and this came out of my time in cardiac theaters, um, is a patient specific way. So if you're in resus, you're dealing with the one patient. So you, you will know what their weight is. So if you draw up the resuscitation dose for that patient in one in 10,000 adrenaline, okay? So say you've got a five kilo patient, you draw 0.5 of a mil of one in 10,000. If you then dilute that into 10 mils, one mil of that solution is one mic per kilo for that particular patient. And you can give a half to one mil as a bolus if the patient becomes unstable and it'll give them a bit of a, 
inotropic support while you get other measures ready. So it's just one of those kind of rescue things that you can have to make life a little bit easier for yourself. So, okay. And that is actually primarily a lot of what I'm going to talk about because we're concentrating mostly on um, dealing with the patients when they're in your emergency department. Noradrenaline, I'm not going to dwell on too much. I'm not really going to dwell on um, because we don't encounter that hot, sh hot shock so often. But if you do, I would recommend giving it through your IO needle. Okay. So really just concentrating on peripheral linotropes and really generally you should be using adrenaline rather than dopamine. So to summarize, yes, okay, I did do some pharmacology. I can't help it, sorry. Um, you're most likely to encounter septic shock in a pa pediatric population, but that involves a low cardiac output picture in young children. So vasopressors are not necessarily appropriate. You start inotropes and you need to start them early if there's evidence of unresolved shock when, when they're fluid refractory. And you can give it peripherally and adrenaline may have an outcome benefit over dopamine. Okay, and don't forget your interosseous cannula because it is a great surrogate for a central line. Okay, thank you. Any questions? <laughs>